I'm uh, State Rep Chris Conley. I live in Groton, and I represent Groton and Ledger. Uh, two years ago, I ran for State Rep because I thought that things weren't going uh, well for Groton and Ledger. I was on the RTM trying to balance budgets with less and less money to the town and saw school projects being passed over for funding and our businesses leaving. Um, over the last two years, I've not only been a strong voice for Groton and Ledger, but also gotten some great results. I was happy to be able to restore the funding that the governor cut to my towns. I was pleased to be able to get uh, both towns, their school projects funded with $147 million in state grants going to build our schools, which will um, help many of our residents not have increased taxes. I was also very pleased to move the law in the right direction by alleviating social security taxes on seniors. Um, and helping our businesses, helping Electric Boat be able to have a generational growth to make sure that our, our Connecticut residents have the excellent jobs that are available at Electric Boat right now. And also moving the law to make sure that women, um, children and families are getting proper health insurance coverage so that mammograms are covered. And also to make sure that, that our kids have what they need in school. I do think there's a lot more work to be done for our state. Um, I think that we have amazing people working here and living here, and together we can move our state on the right direction. I, as I believe there's more work to do, that's why I'm running for re-election this year. Um, a, uh, just forward to get some questions uh, on kind of general issues uh, facing the state, kind of a, an issue that's come up in, in your race uh, uh, two years ago. Uh, you were criticizing your opponent, uh, John Scott, who was then the incumbent uh, representative, um, uh, implying that he had uh, put legislation in that could have benefit, benefit himself as an insurance agent that was self-serving. Um, he's criticized you for sort of doing the same thing in your line of work, that you sponsored le legislation that would uh, a work to the favor of uh, workers' compensation attorneys, which I believe is your line of work when you're not in the legislature. So could, could, you, could you address that, that um, was, you know, the kettle calling the pot black um, in this instance? Yes, I, what, my, um, what John's bill did is very different than the bill that I helped one of my colleagues work on. First of all, I never introduced legislation for workers' comp insurance. Um, one of my colleague Susan Johnson has been working on legislation for many years since the D'Olivera case was rendered, the decision was rendered in 2005. At that point, the state of Connecticut Supreme Court made it so that the cause of action, if someone is unduly delayed, could not be brought in our state courts. Um, that wasn't a decision made by the General Assembly, it was a decision made by our Connecticut C Supreme Court. And Susan Johnson represents a gentleman who had a delayed back surgery, and because of that, he's paralyzed uh, in a wheelchair bound. So ev for many years, Susan has put in a bill um, trying to get a vote on the General Assembly as to whether or not this cause of action should have been gotten rid of by the courts. Again, a lot of my um, friends on the other side of the aisle say that they don't like judges to change to be activist judges, and this is, is one of the situations where the judge changed the law, not the uh, state Supreme Court. When my colleague Susan Johnson asked me for some help in Judiciary Committee, I was you know, pleased to help her. She asked me to co-sponsor the bill. I co-sponsored it. Um, but again, it's been a bill that's been up many times. And as far as my opponent saying I would get billable hours, that's just false. Workers' comp attorneys get a percentage of certain benefits. Under our current law, um, if there is undue delay, I can petition the Workers' Comp Commission for costs under the current statute as it's written. So I, he just doesn't understand the law. He doesn't understand this case is from 2005. And he's trying to make uh, an issue for the voters that doesn't exist. I would not be the only one who could bring a claim. There are thousands of attorneys across the state of Connecticut. Whereas in his bill at that time, and I know his business has changed, I don't know if he still has the Yukon contract. That's for him to, to say or not. Um, but at that time, he was one of three who had a specific contract for Yukon. I am one of thousands of attorneys across the state of Connecticut, and anyone can bring a claim in any court um, for reasons that they see fit under the law. And uh, before we move on, what, what was the fate of that bill? And any, uh, in retrospect, any would you have done anything differently in retrospect? So the, fit, the bill did make it through Judiciary Committee, which is what Representative Johnson asked me to help her with. It did not make it through Appropriations Committee, um, so it never got a, bit, a vote on the House or Senate floor. 
I think, you know, it, it's difficult to say, you know, would it have been easy to tell a colleague, no, I don't want to help you um, because maybe a year later I'd have to sit in front of a reporters answering questions. Of course, it's always easy to, to take, say, no, I, I care about myself and not you. Um, but I would say if, if a colleague asked me for help on something that, that really affects one of their constituents, that's why we're there to serve. And I, you know, if, if there's a vote, there's a vote and majority wins. But again, it is not self-serving to me in any way. It's, it's really to, to let the courts, what, do we want the courts to lead or do we want um, the General Assembly to make the laws? All right. Um, as we're on kind of the big, one of the, probably the big issue, uh, at least in our minds uh, for this election, and it's trying to restore some fiscal stability uh, to the state, uh, it seems. Um, you know, every year or two, the state is again looking at a deficit. Um, a couple of big causes, is, you know, you, you well know, is the pension obligations are eating up a bigger and bigger chunk of the budget as our our, our, our legacy debt. Uh, so, uh, the two years under your belt, uh, seeking reelection, what mindset would you have going uh, back to Hartford? Is it how? we might address that and try to get uh, some stability here in Connecticut fiscally. Yeah. Oh, I hear a lot of people talk about how Connecticut's broke. We have $20 billion in our budget each year. That is a lot of money, but it means we can do $20 billion worth of services and things for the people in the state of Connecticut. It means we can't do $30 billion because we, we don't have $30 billion. We have $20 billion. To make our budget balance, I think there's two things we have to look at. Uh, the teachers' pensions is up for basically a balloon payment. And that's a big factor. So we need to get some revenue coming in. There's uh, talks about moving some lottery revenue over or redoing the teachers' pensions, um, refinancing to get rid of that balloon payment. And I think both those things are things that need to be looked at so that we can free up that money um, to do the basic services. The other thing I think we need to look at, uh, Representative Urban has been talking for years about you know, doing results-based accounting to really look at our programs find where the duplicities are and see if programs are serving the people um, when there are multiple programs doing the same thing, which program is we're getting the best cost-effective service for the people and switching folks over to the right types of programs so that they, we're not only saving money but also serving people better. Um, and I think if we can do some of that, we can free up some the other money and deal with the deficit in a smart way. Um, should, um, should the late legislature you know, beginning with the governor, uh, go back to the unions and seek uh, potentially more concessions to try to bring out more savings as far as, um, uh, you know, the cost of benefits, uh, uh, the, 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 the pension uh, that they're eligible for, or, um, you know, has, has you've already wrung out sufficient savings uh, from, from those union members. So I'm not running for governor. Uh, so sure. the, the three gentlemen who are running for governor, I would let them answer as to what they wish to do as governor. I fully um, think that our last CBAC agreement, I know we get a lot of criticism on it. It, it did some big changes. It moved our, our employees, new employees, to a 401k hybrid, which saved an awful lot of money. People have been talking about doing that for years, and it finally got done. Um, it also really changed the, the health insurance and to a way that was a lot more similar to the private sector world. And the union members did agree to do that. Um, they did agree to do that to avoid layoffs. And I would, I, as I talk to union members, I think most folks are expecting that July 1st when insurance um, gets redone is that they, just like most workers in the private sector, will be asked to pay a little more each month um, and to really, to make sure that, that our benef the benefits of state workers and the benefits of private sector workers are similar. Um, but I do want to be clear that I don't want the benefits of state workers to be so low that state workers are then on Husky, um, getting rental rebates, getting money for social services, for heating um, and food, food stipends, because we want to make sure that we're not cutting so much on benefits in one direction that we're increasing our social services on the other. Everything is, is a balance. Um, uh, another big issue is job growth in Connecticut. We've seen some pick up lately, certainly some good news here in Southeast Connecticut with the uh, electric boat expansion. Uh, but yeah, Connecticut has lagged behind, substantially behind some of our neighboring states since, uh, since the recession and job 
both in recovery. Uh, kind of what have you done in that vein and, and what needs to be done just to get Connecticut to catch up and see job growth? A lot of my work when I uh, did this last year had to do with electric vote and their, their legislative package to provide the assistance that they requested. And we were able to, to come through with them in, in this tight budget to get them 83 million to help dredge that river right to over to my right um, to get some more job training. Because now Electric Boat's telling me that their biggest problem is they don't have enough workers to fill the open jobs. And that's, while a tough problem for them, great news for our economy, that their biggest problem is not having enough workers, too many jobs and not enough folks. I uh, hear that there's, there's not enough housing, especially for young people who are looking for a smaller housing or, or more apartments. So right now I'm working on that with builders um, to get housing. And when we, as we have more apartments being built, we're gonna have contractors being working. We're gonna have folks staying in the hotels, um, folks work at the restaurants, shopping, and really bringing our economy up on the growth of EB. Another thing that really does need to be addressed is our infrastructure. We've had a lot of companies tell the state that they can't get goods or people from one city to another across our state. Uh, we all know that going to New Haven, it should be about 45 minutes, but it's not. 95 isn't. Um, going today from Norwich to here, I got stuck in traffic for a half hour, and again, it should be a 20-minute ride, not a 50-minute ride. So to really understand that while other states around us were working on their infrastructure, we were, we were not. Uh, we're behind an infrastructure and we need to address it so that our bus businesses and people can get around our state. Um, on transportation, where do you stand on uh, in, in imposing tolls on the highways as a way of uh, raising revenue to meet our transportation needs? Yeah. I know my opponent uh, disagrees and I know that he drives a lovely electric car and doesn't have to pay any money for, for fuel taxes at all. But for the rest of us who are still paying fuel taxes, I think it's very clear that we need to follow our neighboring states and do the truck tolls that Rhode Island has, the electronic tolls, um, because we need to have the funds to fix our infrastructure. I can look out the window and see the Gold Star Bridge and knowing that that cost over $240 million is the estimated for both sides of the bridge. When I hear my opponent talk about that, that budgets are gonna put a billion dollars uh, to investment that's going to fix all of our infrastructure that's false you know our infrastructure is very far behind and the first step we need to do to connecticut is admit we have a problem and then to talk about what's our solution uh, because we need to make sure first of all that people can get to work but most importantly that our bridges aren't falling down and that people aren't injured how do you feel about tolls going beyond trucks into to other vehicles right now i think the trucks is the right step and what was your reaction to, um, do you agree with the Bond Commission approving the $10 million study, or do you think that should have gone through the General Assembly? I think it should have gone through the General Assembly. I don't sit on the Bond Commission, so I didn't have a vote in that matter. And I think it should have been delayed until after the election, um, because if we have a change in governor, depending on who it is, it's $10 million that didn't need to be spent. Um, what's, your, what's your position on the um, $15 minimum wage um, legislation, proposed legislation? So we've had 10-10 as the minimum wage for, it's going to be two years now before we get into the next legislative session. And folks often say, oh, you know, someone working minimum wage is doing a minimum job. Well, that's not true. We have a lot of folks who are, who are helping us, taking care of our children, taking care of our seniors, um, and helping doing all sorts of tasks who get 10, 10 an hour. I think the worst thing that we see with minimum wage is um, how many folks are living on the edge of poverty in our cities and towns, how many folks are getting those rental subsidies, are getting free lunch for their children, getting um, food for themselves and their families, and, and it's not fair to let companies pay people such low wages that our social services continue to rise. So I, I definitely think that we have to look at minimum wage. And uh, paid family leave, and if yes, you know, where does the funding come to, to provide for those folks when they're on paid family leave? So the first question is the easy question. I do support earned family leave. Um, and I, I look at Rhode Island, an economy that's booming a lot better than ours, and they've had temporary disability insurance for, for a while so that their workers, um, it's something that corporations and businesses don't have to provide to their workers is that if someone gets sick or someone has a baby that they have or has a surgery that they can have a few weeks to recover um, and not worry about where's that mortgage payment coming or the rent payment coming that month. The issue that Connecticut stalls with is how to fund it 
I don't have a solution, um, but it's something I, I plan on working with folks to figure out what to do. I don't think bonding is the right way to go. I don't think loaning is the right way to go. I feel more comfortable with a system that's paid in, and when it reaches a certain amount of money, the appropriate amount of money, then money benefits will be paid out. Uh, do you buy the, the, the argument you hear from, particularly from the Republican side, that it's excessive taxation and a heavy tax load that is, is the anchor on, on the Connecticut economy and that it's, it, that's the factor that's that driving people to leave the state? Or, or, or do you think that's a specious argument? You know, our, our New England states and our coastal states have higher taxes than other states. Um, again, I think a lot of our, our issues is the first thing is we have to accept. We, New England is a higher area to live in. Um, New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, we're high tax states, all of us. So when I, I look at why, why do we come back from the economy slower than others, and one of the main reasons I see is people in Connecticut enjoy talking bad about Connecticut. Um, and I say, why would you elect someone who, who just talks bad about Connecticut? Why don't you elect someone who understands that we have problems, admits we have problems, and wants to work on them? So I think our, our biggest asset is our jobs, our skilled workforce that we have in Connecticut, and our, our great asset is our location between Boston and New York, and realize that our infrastructure is lagging. And one of the issues to help get those folks to those cities is infrastructure improvements, um, to make sure that we acknowledge our problems and, and start working on them and have folks who will talk good about Connecticut, who want to stay in Connecticut, lead us into a better economy. Whether it's uh, whether it's tolls or you know the gas tax or other mm. elements that you would use for infrastructure improvements, you know, have you been what have you been hearing from constituents about tolls or other ways to fix infrastructure? I think um, constituents feel differently about tolls, and I think the big question is where are they going to be and how much are they? And depending on where they're going to be and how much they are, people's opinion changes widely. So if we didn't have a toll between, you know, um, Waterford and the Rhode Island border, a lot of my constituents, it wouldn't affect their day to day. So they, they might be okay with that. If it's truck tolls, more people are, far more people are okay with tractor trailer tolls than they are with auto tolls. Um, again, if I say, you know, would you be okay if there was a to one toll in Stanford that cost a dollar, I would say 90% of my constituents are okay with that. But if, again, if there was a, a toll that was closer to us, it feels differently. So I think it really depends. Before people approve it or not, we need to know where they're going to be, how much they are, who's paying them, and what are the rebates. Um, if it is Connecticut residents pay less, if it is a write-off on your taxes for Connecticut tolls, um, and and the whole plan before someone can really say whether or not they approve it. Um, do you think the state um, should legalize marijuana for recreational use by adults and, and, and tap the tax money that would generate? Yes, I do think it should be 21 and over, just like drinking. Um, again, for those who are watching, it doesn't mean you should smoke pot and get in, your, get in a, a car or you know use machinery um, while you're under the influence. I think that pot is a lot like alcohol. It, you know, people can use it at their homes and be responsible adults, but you can also be very irresponsible with any drugs and alcohol. So just like alcohol, we need to regulate it 21 and over, and let's tax it and use that revenue to deal with some of our deficits. Is there any potential problem in our area given EV is such a big employer and, and federally it still would be illegal, and, as far, and, I, and I believe uh, EB people there would be, could be subject to testing. Is that, is that potentially a conflict as we try to feed that pipeline of jobs if we're allowing legal marijuana use? So workers, at, and it's not just EB, many workers are subject to drug tests now, and they, they're told that, so they can't, be, they can't be using marijuana. You know, many, many truck drivers can drink on their off hours, but you certainly can't drink any time close to when you're driving truck. We need to be responsible adults, and for that means for our kids and workers at EB, it means you can't smoke marijuana. Um, uh, we'll give Eric a couple more questions. I just had one on education, and that you, you, do, you did talk about the fight you participate in, try to win back funding for Groton schools under uh, Democratic Governor Malloy. They took a big, big hit initially, um, and after uh, uh, you know. A lot of legislative efforts, uh, including your own, uh, the funding was largely restored. What are the odds, though, of getting to some kind of a more predictable uh, 
education funding formula that, that, that works for our school systems uh, so they don't have to guess year to year how the politics might play out for them as they're trying to you know, pay for and organize their schools. Yeah. So the, the fight we have with Groton, with the governor cutting us $17.5 million to start and, and slowly clawing back each penny of that $17.5 million um, is something that, that, although we were successful and I certainly don't want to do again next year, um, we in Groton will be okay for five years because as an alliance district, we have five years of stable funding. But my other town, Ledger, um, is not an alliance district, so their schools are, are different and funded differently. I think the main thing that we have to do under the next governor is get the education cost-sharing portion of the budget done earlier in the year, um, acknowledging that the towns are doing their budget votes in the you know May and June, and that they, we need we can't be letting them on the whim for months and months. Um, that caused an awful lot of stress for for towns across the state of Connecticut that didn't need to happen. So I think um, making sure that we follow our formula. We have a formula this year that seems to work pretty well. And um, some towns, of course, are winners and some are unhappy with it. But to let those who are unhappy with it have their, their ways, just like Joe, Dela Cruz and I were allowed to, to explain why the formula, first formulas were unfair to Groton, so that folks can explain the uniquenesses in their town. And then we can get all that done um, early in the spring so that folks can do their budgets and know what the schools have. That segues into a question I have. As you know, Ledger had to send out a uh, supplemental tax bill um, to help close the, the town deficit brought on by the state cuts. Um, you kind of alluded to what you would have do differently going forward, but reflecting on that, is there anything that you feel you or your fellow legislators could have done differently to prevent a supplemental tax bill? I think the supplemental tax bill didn't fully have any, um, to do with the state cuts. Ledger did have a bond payment due on building their new police state station. So um, that did have a lot to do with their budget, is that they did have to make that bond payment. I think that as I represent 20% of Ledger, you know, I think that the person who represents 80% of Ledger, it would have been far more helpful if he was working um, better with the whole group and if we could work together in a better way um, so that 100% of Ledger is represented well. Ledger did get a slight cut. The governor did a, a substantial reduction after that, and I did um, support the bill, vote for the bill to stop the governor from having the authority to do mid-year cuts to towns, because it doesn't affect Ledger, it affects other towns. Um, the governor, of course, vetoed that bill, and I was there to override the veto. Unfortunately, the Senate did not override the veto, and the House didn't get to vote on that. But I, I certainly would be next year in favor of limiting the governor's ability to cut municipal aid mid-year. Um, uh, you, you talked a bit about kind of the other ledger representative and, you know, wanting him to, you know, work, work more to, to get that done. Well, I know, you know, we're, parties are kind of more divided than ever. What are some things you feel you've done to step across the aisle or some instances in which you've taken a vote that may have put you at odds with the other Democrats? Yeah, so I voted um, with the Republicans against the Hartford bailout. I think some of my friends were a little surprised with me, but I thought that was the correct vote. I often um, worked with my Republican colleagues on many bills. Um, as a vice chair for planning and development, I wrote bills that, that may not have affected Groton as much, um, but I did write the seeing eye dog bill um, that one of my Senate colleagues did want, and he was a Republican. So I, I very much feel that we should assist others. I find that in Judiciary Committee, we are very collegial. Sometimes votes are partisan, but we are all working together on those. I was able to work um, with my Republican counterparts on Connor's law, a ledger law again, um, that the other representative in ledger did not, um, had some difficulties with to make sure that that we could do that on a different transportation bill when it failed so that Holly Irwin's um, son's memory could be continued with the law that she wanted and to help kids who have, um, to make sure that kids have their helmets and, and that this tragedy doesn't happen to someone else. So you, uh, we're about to our half hour, you want to give us a kind of summary, things maybe that uh, you, you want to note that we didn't cover in, in the questions and sum things up? Sure. You know, I, I think I 
It's a little bit in my same earlier, but I appreciate if anyone did did watch the whole interview. That's thank you for having me, and thank you for watching. Um, I know that our state does have issues, but again, I've been working uh, very hard with my fellow colleagues on addressing our issues, addressing our funding issues, and really moving the law in the right direction. I think it's important um, to understand that we need folks in government who are willing to speak up for ourselves willing to speak up for Connecticut and willing to, to move us forward together. I think while we've done an awful lot of, of good work in this session by making sure that electric boat was funded, making sure that women and children and families can go to the doctors, um, and making sure that our seniors did get some tax relief, that there's more work to do. And that's why I plan on running for re-election. I hope I have your vote in November. All right, thank you. Thank you.